Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good evening, and depending on where you are in the world, uh, good afternoon or even good morning, and welcome to the first of our uh, webinar series of the second webinar series of 2020 entitled Women Who Changed the Discussion, uh, hosted by Movement and Ac Skill Acquisition Ireland. Um, Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland is comprised of Ed Collin, Phil Carney, Alan Dunton, and myself, Ollie Logan, and we are very passionate about skill acquisition, coaching science and youth development. And we hope that by hosting these webinars, we're able to connect you with some of the leading figures in these respective areas. So uh, for those of you that, that tuned in, our first webinar series ran from April to June of this year. And you can check out uh, those webinars on our YouTube channel. That's MSA Ireland. I think uh, one of the guys is going to put the, um, the URL on, on the chat box so you can check it out if you want to. Um, our first speaker in that webinar series was a, a lady called Sarah Kelleher, who's a former Ireland field hockey captain and, and currently coaches the England under 18s. And, and Sarah spoke passionately about the need for greater efforts to raise the profile of female, female coaches in an interview with the Irish Examiner and as a lead up um, to our, our uh, conference and webinar series. She said, we need more stories and more voices. And in response to Sarah's call, we have decided to go with the theme, Women Who Changed the Discussion for our second season. And, and in this, we're actually really fortunate to be supported uh, in this series by the uh, 20 by 20 campaign here in Ireland. And the 20 by 20 campaign is, uh, is, a, is a campaign creating a cultural shift in the perception of girls and women in sport. There's so much to celebrate when it comes to women's sport in Ireland, but there isn't enough noise. So they're attempting to make some noise um, through kind of some of the hashtags and the, and the themes of if she can't see it, she can't be it. And 20 by 20 is three targets to reach by the end of 2020, which is 20% more media coverage of women in sport, 20% more female participation at player, coach, referee, and administrative level, and 20% more attendance at women's games and events. So again, we're really thankful to have their support and, and hopefully this can um, assist with some of their goals around, around their campaign. So for those of you in the webinar in, um, in, in Zoom, I would request that you put yourselves on mute during the presentation. And if you do have uh, questions that crop up during the, the, during the um, presentation, if you put those in the chat box, which should be at the bottom of your screen, we'll come to you after the presentation. If you're watching on YouTube today, please put your uh, questions in the comments section and uh, we'll come to you again at the end of the presentation. So that's it from me. Without further ado, I want to hand over to Ed to introduce our speakers for today. Thanks, Ali, and um, and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome the new new people to Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland, and welcome back to those who've been with us before. Um, when we decided on the theme for our, our this webinar series, it was a slam dunk of a decision whom we would hope to have had as our first guests, and. It doesn't come much bigger than um, Dr. Gabrielle Wolf and Dr. Rebecca Luthwaite when you consider the, the theme of women who've changed the discussion, when you see the work that they've done uh, individually, but also collectively, and none more so in the work of their optimal theory. I've been spending the week um, enjoying going back over the paper, a paper that every one of us in Movement Skill Acquisition Ireland know very well, and any of us who lecture our students know very well. And, the, 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 the optimal stands for optimizing performance through intrinsic motivation and attention for learning. And for fear of, of taking up any more time, I would just like to hand over and say a big thank you and a sincere um, well wishes from us to, to, to Gabby and Rebecca. And uh, we look forward to the questions that come from, the, from everyone tuning in as well. And all, over to you guys, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. We are excited to be here and we greatly appreciate the 20 Irish 20 by 20 campaign. You're aligning the theme of this webinar series with it. So we look forward to the day when events like this uh, honoring women's contributions will be puzzling to all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> okay, let me, yeah. okay, share my screen. Um, so Rebecca and I, I'm Gabby Wolf, this is Rebecca, <laughs> and we would like to give an overview of the optimal theory um, of motor learning that we proposed a few years ago. Uh, I, we can't see your screen there, Gabby, if you want to try share your screen again. Oh, please. that's interesting. Thank you for letting me know. Hold on. It 
it just appeared on my computer and I assumed you could see it too, but. Yeah, that's it now, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. So as Ed already mentioned, um, OPTIMAL is an acronym. Um, it stands for Optimizing Performance Through Intrinsic Motivation and Attention for Learning. And, um, you know, based on a lot of evidence, converging evidence, we identified uh, motivational and attentional factors that seem to play a key role when it comes to enhancing performance and learning. And so in our theory, we have two motivational key factors, autonomy, performer autonomy, and what we've called enhanced expectancies and an attentional factor, an external focus of attention. And we would like to present some findings that really highlight the importance of each factor. And Rebecca is going to start by um, talking about autonomy. So autonomy or autonomy support as we describe it here, refers to acknowledgement or recognition of a learner's agency and having some control over their own actions. And autonomy support may be offered in many large or smaller ways. In this study, uh, participants were brought into the laboratory to learn three exercises, each of which involved uh, standing on one leg. And errors in the performance of this task involve typically uh, losing balance and having to stand on the opposite leg. So in this uh, study, there were two groups. One group called the choice group was simply asked the question, in which order would you like to complete the three exercises? The control group was linked or yoked to a participant in the choice group. Each member of the control group had their own counterpart and they got the order that that counterpart had chosen. So always the same number of people with the same order. And what you can see uh, in this graph, which shows the number of errors, the group that had choice, that simple choice of which order actually uh, performed better in the retention task a day later when they came back to the laboratory. So small choices can enhance balance learning in this case. In a second study with children, the task involved bowling um, across the floor. And this was a, um, a performance study, meaning there was no learning component to it, but each child got uh, a condition in which they got a choice of which of these four balls they wanted to use. So you could see the little uh, printed stickers on the balls and the child could choose. They also had a condition in which they got no choice. They were just given the white ball. So here you can see a participant who is choosing amongst the balls. She's very happy with her choice. Um, and it turns out that when the children were in the choice condition where they had chosen which ball, they knocked down more pins in this bowling task than when they had no choice. So this next study we wanted to share is actually one that was um, done by my former um, doctoral student, Takehiro Iwatsuki. And I like it because it nicely illustrates how autonomy support can also enhance movement efficiency. So in this case, participants were asked to learn to produce certain forces using plantar flexion. And the goal was to um, produce 80, 50, or 20% of maximum voluntary contractions. Um, again, each participant performed under two conditions, in a counterbalanced order. In the choice condition, they could choose the order of the torques, 80, 50, or 20%. In the control condition, they were uh, linked or yoked to somebody else's um, choice. Uh, let me show you the torques first. Um, the choice group in red and the control group in blue showed similar torques, which was expected because 
Well, they had a target line on a computer screen that they tried to match. However, um, as you can see here, muscle activation or EMG activity was significantly lower in the choice group, in the choice condition, I should say. So in other words, people produced the same torque, the same amount of force, but did so more efficiently when they had a choice. So in this uh, presentation, the Los Angeles Lakers of a few years back had at one time uh, coach Phil Jackson, who was known for his innovations and in, uh, working with players. And he had a strategy where during timeouts, the players were asked to huddle in their own group with the other players and uh, consider what the next play out, coming out of the timeout would be. And the coaches did the same thing. They huddled in a separate place. Then they came back together before the end of the timeout very quickly. They shared their plans and the coach went with, okay, we like your play, we'll, we'll run that or we'll go with ours this time. Very quick, but even in the midst of a competitive game, there was this opportunity to provide some form of autonomy support. Um, let me speak now to the concept of enhanced expectancies. And this refers to the anticipation of a good experience or outcome. And enhanced expectancies can be produced in many ways um, by coaches or by athletes themselves. And they're consistent with the notion of confidence uh, for something that's valued. And in optimal theory, enhanced expectancies are associated with the experience of reward and dopamine release in the brain's reward system. So in this um, instance, the Enhanced expectancies were formed by um, defining success in, in several different ways. So here, novice golfers came into a laboratory, saw a putting mat, saw in the center of that putting uh, far end, a yellow target. And around that target were two different sized circles. Everybody saw everything. One group, was told that balls ending up in the blue or the larger circle are considered good trials. The other group was told that balls ending up in the red or the smaller circle are considered good trials. So what was found after practice, they came back to the lab and they putted again, first at the same distance. And you could see that um, deviation from the target is plotted here. So the group, the red, uh, box group had fewer, had less deviation from the target. They were more accurate. And the same applied when you shifted distance to a longer transfer distance. Um, the, again, the large circle group who would have encountered more identified good trials because it was a larger circle. In fact, they had identified, uh, had met that criterion, but relative to the yellow target, they were more accurate. In this next study of enhanced expectancies, um, in this case, women who were part of a university extension activity program were recruited to learn how to balance on this rather challenging uh, stabilometer or balance platform. And in this case, enhanced expectancy was um, operationalized as a single comment that was given at the beginning of practice. So the people in the enhanced expectancy group were told active people with your experience usually do well on this task and the control group not. And this was given, this statement was given to the enhanced expectancy group um, once at the very beginning of the practice session. When they came back, and you can see they're already beginning to diverge, but they came back in the retention test a day later. And in fact, they were significantly better at more time and balance on trials than their counterparts in the control group. So just this sense of lifting expectations can result in an uh, powering up of performance, in this case, learning. 
one can think of the enhancing expectancies construct as applying to not only newbie or novice learners, but to experienced athletes, to um, elite athletes. In this case, uh, the study involved experienced runners who normally put in a uh, good mileage a week. They were asked to run on a treadmill for 20 minutes at 75% of their VO2 max, which was previously determined. One group during the second half of the run was given a positive feedback comment every two minutes. It differed across the, the two minutes periods. Uh, for example, you're doing great. You look very relaxed. You're an efficient runner. The other group, the control group was not given a comment while they ran. And what happened was the enhanced expectancy group began to use less oxygen to perform this task. So they actually became more efficient in their movement, in their running motion, as they received these positive feedback statements across the last half of the task. And I think it's, it's pretty uh, common to think, yes, confidence matters when you go into uh, high level performance. And that might, that might be the difference between doing something and not. And there's some evidence in uh, some in interesting studies. In this case, um, Rosenquist and Scans looked at the performance across 16,000 rounds of uh, performers in the European PGA Tour. And what they looked at specifically was whether it mattered whether a performer, a golfer made the cut in a given tournament to advance from the second round into the third round where the field was smaller. And if they made that cut barely, they were more likely in the subsequent tournament they played in to uh, perform better than if they just barely by one stroke missed the cut. And this was an even more positive impact when the next tournament was of higher stakes. So there's some evidence that in, even in high level competitive sport, this approach to, in, in this case, the, they believed that they did better because they made the cut. Okay, next, let me talk a little bit about an external focus of attention, which also turns out to be a key factor for well, optimizing performance and learning. Um, for those who are not as familiar with this line of research, let me first uh, talk about the opposite. An internal focus has been defined as a concentration on body movements. So here's some examples. These could be instructions that a coach might give or thoughts a performer might have. So they're all body related. Now an external focus in contrast is um, the concentration on the intended movement effect. That can be you know, an effect on an implement, as you can see here. It can also be an image. And as it turns out, an external focus is considerably more effective for both immediate performance and learning. Now that windsurfer on the left there, uh, that's actually a, a photo of me on Lake Garda in Italy. And just last week, I happened to um, convert some old VHS tapes to digital format. And I came across some videos that showed me practicing a power jibe and, or performing it at least. And let me just show you a couple of clips here. In the first case, um, I most likely had an internal focus. I might've focused on where to position my feet on the board and you'll see the consequences of that. I practice trying to do everything right with my body for hours and hours and eventually I decided to just focus on turning the board and let me show you what that looked like or looks like when you Thank you. 
But more interestingly, look at what happens at the muscular level. So here we have in red the soleus, the agonist, um, under external focus condition and internal, as you can see, and also the antagonist, the tibialis anterior. And look at what happens. For one, the soleus is more active when people actually focus on it, but also the antagonist, the tibialis anterior, is much more active. And the result is a much more noisy force curve, as you can see here in green. So this, this is very typical. And this is one participant. Here's another one. You see the same pattern. Here's a third one. And again, the same. So you focus on one body part and you become much less accurate and efficient. Okay. So another part of the theory involves the concept of how it is that these factors, these brief thoughts or brief instructions can exert their influence all the way to motor performance and learning. We call the way in which these operate as goal action coupling. So goal action coupling refers to the fluidity with, with which the intended goal is translated into action. And there's some cognition or thought about either instruction or confidence or being autonomous that is translated into brain activity. And it seems to occur um, two very uh, classic ways. One's called functional connectivity. And this refers to the way and the order in which So if there's a visual component, how it accesses the visual cortex, for example. And this time-linked activity uh, changes with the given task elements, and it changes with practice. And there's more distinct functional connection um, associated with a higher level of skill. So in a way, the brain becomes well-oiled at finding the way it needs to bring things together for the task. There are also structural brain changes that occur with learning. And these include the formation of new connections or dendritic spine growth known as synaptogenesis and other neuroplastic processes. So the brain actually changes as a function of training or learning. One of the supports to these connections uh, is the neurotransmitter dopamine which seems to support efficiencies in connectivity, as well as memory consolidation and learning. And it is released among other times when reward is anticipated. And so we think this is a mechanism by which our motivational factors uh, come to play in facilitating these uh, efficient connections in the brain. Okay, kind of toward the end here, I want to address a question that you may have asked yourself perhaps, and that is, is every factor, are all factors relevant here, or is it just sufficient to give people an external focus instruction, for example? Or does, you know, in this case, adding more factors consecutively, um, or adding them consecutively, incrementally improve motor performance? I'll show you what I mean by that. First of all, the task was a maximum counter movement jump. Exactly. So first of all, all participants did a baseline test, jumping as high as possible five times. And then um, in one group, we gave, we provided or implemented one factor on each subsequent uh, block of trials. In one case, we gave positive feedback to enhance people's expectancies. On another block, they might have received autonomy support by being able to choose which figure to jump from. And um, an external focus was uh, promoted by asking people to focus on a marker that they had on their belt. So bring the marker up as high up as, as possible. So everybody had a different order of factors that uh, they were provided with. And here's the result. So relative to the first baseline block that you don't see here, 
you can see in the control condition, nothing really happens. They jumped as high as they did before. But every time we added one other factor, independent of which one it was, in the optimized group, people jumped higher and higher. So this finding is actually consistent with other ones that show, for example, that also learning is enhanced if you have, you know, two or even three factors. You learn best if you have all three factors present. Okay, and at the end here, let me ask you one question. Which scenario is more typical in practical settings? This one where an instructor selects the tasks that people are practicing, describes how the action should be performed, where they give feedback, corrections, and instructions that refer to body movements, or this one, where an instructor gives people small to moderate choices, letting them choose when they want to receive feedback, for example, or the ball color, um, and where they highlight good aspects of performance and sometimes ignore mistakes and where they don't talk about body movements, but direct attention externally. Well, when I asked my students this, this question, they all seem to agree that the first scenario is more typical. So let's see what happens if you have these conditions. Well, you don't have much of any autonomy, probably relatively low expectations because people get corrected all the time. They have an internal focus and all these things contribute to a high self-focus, a detrimental focus on the self, on the body, worries about you know, abilities and so forth. Performance is not great, learning is not optimal. You might even create a vicious cycle where people realize they're not doing all that well, they're not having that much fun. Um, so they might you know, lose motivation and uh, the worst case scenario, drop out. Now let's look at the second scenario where you have all three ingredients uh, that we talked about. You have goal action coupling and they really allow, these factors allow people to focus on the task goal. If they have an external focus, if they're confident, that's what they do. And performance as we've seen is good. Learning is enhanced. And so in this case, we think that you might produce a virtue cycle where people like what they're doing. They like how they're performing and learning. They gain confidence and uh, you know, might uh, be more likely to enjoy practicing. Okay, that's all we have. So thank you very much again for the opportunity. And we'd be happy to answer any questions people might have. Thanks, guys. I, I think uh, that was wonderful and a really great, uh, really well presented. I know there's a huge amount more to 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 this topic, um, and so thank you so much for being able to condense it in such a clear way. Um, I, we we at this stage we move over to the guys who've been manning the questions. Uh, Phil is on Zoom and Alan is on and um, the YouTube. So I'll pass over to Phil to see what questions are, are coming in, so that you can connect directly with those who have questions. Thanks, guys. So just while we're setting up the first question, I'm going to ask one of my own. Um, really interested in the videos from Lake Garda. So does this mean that we had a world premiere of the origins of internal external focus research <laughs> within our, our webinar tonight? You did, exactly. Like I said, I discovered, rediscovered them last week, so a few days ago. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so our first question comes from Amy Fitzgerald. And oftentimes we're making very subtle changes. What you describe here, you know, they're, they're quite subtle changes in communication. And I think that might be behind Amy's question. So, um, Amy, do you want to, to ask the question yourself in case there's any context that you want to add to that? I'm not sure, I'm not sure Amy's in oh. the call still, so... Um... Okay, well, I might do a circle back to, to Amy. We have uh, a second question which has come in from uh, Julia. So uh, one of the preachers of your presentation was that the diversity of populations that we were dealing with. We saw novices and experienced athletes. We saw children and adults. We saw uh, older athletes as well. Uh, so Julia had a question earlier about another setting. Uh, Julia, uh, are you there?
So if you can, uh, you should be able to unmute her and she might be able to talk. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, maybe I can just quickly address that point. I mean, that's a very good observation. And yeah, so all three factors actually have been demonstrated to be beneficial independent of any individual differences, such as, you know, age, disability or ability, uh, what else? Um, yeah, the sport skill type, skill, skill level, level, skill yeah. level, task type. Yeah, yeah. Good point. I think one of the the, the options that was that was that we've seen ourselves even just anecdotally with 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 coaches in our area around here is in, in the space of rehabilitation um, and just how it can be impacted with with the rehabilitation of in, of of injuries, but especially they seem to speak a lot around the lower leg region so as to take the focus away from looking down at the feet or the ankles or the knees and to focus more out and um, again just uh, that's just another domain that I see and I've seen huge benefit of that external focus of attention but also uh, the application of optimal theory in the rehabilitation space. Yes uh, and I work in a rehabilitation center and so a lot of my uh, opportunities to observe how well this works as you say with people with all kinds of, you know, stroke, spinal cord injury, brain injuries, ankle problems, although I don't see many there, but it seems to be across the board that, you know, even when we have very traumatic injuries, most of our system is intact and it operates mm -hmm. along these dimensions. And so um, it could be very dramatic to say to somebody, uh, as they're learning just to, to stay upright after a stroke, for example, they're sitting on a mat and you could say, you know, lean to your good arm or lean to your other arm, but they do much better when you put, as uh, Mughal and others have done, you put a green dot on the bench and you say, lean to the green dot and they lean much farther. Um, yes. Touch your shoe, not foot, touch your shoe, to the place where the tiles on the floor come together. So just finding uh, external focus immediate in your media environment, um, building confidence. So I usually like to say, you know, put, put three trials together. And the first one you wanna make success happen. So, all right, let's just see uh, how long it takes or how many, how many steps you can take in 10 seconds. So I compress it, how many steps? Oh, I think I could do maybe two. Well, let's just see. Okay, try it. They try it. And indeed they say, oh, I did four. And so then you say, well, what kind of goal would you like to set for the next time? And they say four. And you say, I'm pretty sure you can beat that, but let's try it. And they try it and they get 10. And you're celebrating at all points. Woohoo! Big part of this is accentuating the positive. You have assets, you have positive outcomes. You don't even kind of go into the negative zone, but they do that three times in a row and they're pretty convinced you've built their confidence that they can do this task. And you know, so that's, it is extremely important in um, environments where people are in a down state. Yes. That's really nice. I, and again, really nice to get this detail. I think one of the things you speak context. to there. Sorry, Phil. Oh, I think we've got a little bit of a delay where I am. Sorry, I was thinking that that was a really nice answer to Julia's question in terms of what she was asking around the, the rehabilitation context. And it was really nice to get a, a specific example of how that might work. Um, I'm just going to go to, to Nick Winkleman next, who's somebody whose name would be very familiar to um, uh, to individuals who are interested in, in how this applies within a sporting context. So Nick, I've just unmuted you there. If you'd like to ask your question in case you have any context you'd like to add to it as well. Of, of course, Gabby and Rebecca, wonderful presentation as always. Um, so, so for me, the question is around the motivational factors in optimal theory. So obviously you've clearly shown around, let's say competence or confidence or self-efficacy, whatever term we want to give it, uh, most certainly autonomy, are you going to, or have you started to look at, let's say that third variable in self-determination theory around relatedness and let's say the, the relationship community side of motivation? 
Uh, it's a great question. Um, it, it might feel like this, this comes out of self-determination theory, but actually it began back in the 1960s when there were some studies showing uh, really incidental type choices that drove um, people's morbidity and mortality actually in nursing homes. But one of the things that all three factors, if you were to add a uh, social inclusion or relatedness element, it, the assumption is they're all rewarding. And so, uh, you know, optimal theory is based on the notion that if you can provide reward of an intrinsic sort, or even extrinsic, and that does sometimes work for a limited time, but intrinsic reward, I would presume that it will um, share some of the uh, impacts. And indeed, uh, actually speaking of, of populations who might be disabled, we have used uh, the concept of um, social inclusion with people with Parkinson's disease. And it acts as very rewarding for them because they become isolated as they go forward in their disease progression. And so, um, yes, I expect that is going to operate in fairly similar ways. Um, they will there, sometimes therefore be a little more extrinsic to the task, but intrinsic to the person. So they're rewarding. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So our next question comes from, from Michael and he's not able to, to ask itself, I think. So I'm going to ask it on his behalf. He says in gross skills, like moving from sit to stand or jumping, when the skill has no clear influence on the environment, does practice with artificial environmental cue, like perhaps a visual cue, transfer to real life situations when the cue is absent? Um, it, it does. I mean, I'm not aware of any studies that looked at, um, what do you call it, virtual um, Reality. environments. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, we do know that, um, you know, if you train with an external focus, if you practice, for example, on something you have, a sticker you have attached to your clothing, uh, if you take that away, you know, people are still um, able to move as effectively and efficiently as they did with that sticker on. And in some cases, we actually used a more stringent test of this idea, which is a good question. So even if you have people practice with an internal or external focus, and then you use a transfer test in which you distract them by asking them to do another task so that they can't focus on what they originally focused on, they do better if they had practice with an external focus. And I think another way of, of thinking about this, this notion of how real does it need to be is it, when you think about it, um, all skills are learned in context or they're performed in context. Um, and we always in, in our practice sessions try to make them somewhat real. We, we isolate certain factors and we focus there and then we add some backs, including things like crowd noise as we're all experiencing in these virtual uh, performances we're looking at. But I think context is important and I think context comes into play because it elicits the functional connectivity that's associated with that skill. And so, we actually ask a question in, in rehab. We start out by the first thing that we talk to a patient about is, um, given where you are right now, what would be the most important thing we could work on together? So A, it says, I'm going to support your autonomy. We're gonna do it together. That's autonomy support as well. This places it at a high level and then it invokes the skills that they are most thinking about. So somebody says, I want, I used to be a salsa dancer. I want to return to that. So immediately in their head are all of those connections that have had to do with their salsa dancing. So they have high incentive and high motivation, but it was done by asking them what they wanted to achieve. Um, and, and so I think it has a lot to do with, with how well things work. That's great. And I really like that that, you know, that, that line, what's the most important thing that we can work on together? I think that's a really nice, uh, a really nice phrase to remember. Yeah. So the next question has been asked by both James Grant and also Martin uh, sent this on earlier from via email. 
have you got any tips or advice on the best application of, of uh, these kind of communication tips when you're working with a group that speak a different language? You know, uh, I, I actually do because I maintain that you could put all of these three factors in play with just gestures. So, I mean, oftentimes we do work with people who have cognitive impairments and confusion right off the bat after a stroke. And so expressing it all verbally can be um, overwhelming. So for example, um, pointing at a, a spot on a mirror in the gym and saying, focus there, just pointing. And then uh, they do it and thumbs up, do a little more, we'll try it again. <laughs> And you can really get very far with just gestures. So that's the baseline. And then I'm sure there are some shared words and then some shared actions. I mean, you have the advantage when there's a soccer ball in front of you, you can kick it to the net and that right then says that's the goal. And, uh, and then you can start elaborating as needed. It's wonderful, that's, that's really nice examples as well. I think that's what's really useful about this to, to be able to get those examples. So our next question comes from Adrian DeCampo. And Adrian asks a question that I'm actually very interested in as well myself about refining well-learned techniques. So if you've got somebody who's got a well-learned movement pattern or habit. And so Adrian asks, is an external focus of attention also useful if the person has already an existing and stable movement pattern competing against the new one that he or she is trying to learn? That's a good question. That's obviously, obviously a very difficult problem. You have automated a movement pattern. It's very hard to change that. But the only hope really that you have here is to try to find, I think, an external focus in addition to the other factors we talked about. Um, trying to think of studies. I remember one that uh, Bob Christina, I think, did with the experienced golfers. So, um, they found uh, ways to promote an external focus. I think uh, the focus was on the direction of the club motion. Um, so that actually benefited them rather than talking about, I think it was arm mm -hmm. movements. Sorry, I I'm, I'm, can think of the details right now, but that's one in which experienced performers try to change a technique or flaw in the technique. And it worked quite well with an external focus. And I think this is where um, calling upon some of the other factors can help. For example, if we have said to people in the studies and outside all the time, uh, it turns out that the research shows that when you focus externally, you do better. So you might say to somebody, would you like to try an external focus in this, this trial? And usually when you ask people nicely, that is autonomy supportively, they say, yeah, okay, I'll try it. <laughs> almost always they rarely rarely resist at that point and so when they try it and you say how'd that feel and sometimes they're surprised that felt better um, sometimes they're not and say okay if you ever want to try that again we could kind of pick between this and this and see what works best for you so I think it's uh, getting into the the habit of uh, you know listening to feedback listening to coaching listening to um, you know, a different way to do something. But that's how I would do it. Let me just maybe briefly add one other thing. It's not directly related to the question, but to expert performers. And I did a study with a colleague in Munich, Adina Mornell. We asked very, very skilled musicians to play a piece of music on their respective instrument. And when we asked them to play for the audience, the focus on the music essentially, they did significantly better than they did under control conditions. So even at a very high skill level, there's still room for improvement. And I would think also for changes in technique and so forth, um, you know, with an mm -hmm. external focus. Yeah, I, I think it's great how you guys are able to create a link between not only your external focus of attention, but also autonomy and how you can create that nice flow between the two and, and coming to autonomy we've got a, a question in on youtube um and it's it's asked that how um, might a coach provide autonomy effectively in a team practice setting where you've got multiple players okay great question 
So uh, let's take an example. Um, a team is practicing some penalty kicks in soccer. So the coach might say to the team, okay, fellas, um, should we choose the right upper quadrant of the goal net this time or the left lower? They all say, uh, okay, everyone's going to go with the right upper. Okay, great. There's your choice. You were going to do it anyway. So no skin off anybody's back. You're not missing opportunities. You have them try that. You start asking them how that go. Whew. Okay, can we do better? And the first time you do it, you might actually use a, a shorter distance, for example, and then you back it up. Let's, should we try that again? And we'll back it up five meters. Okay, try it from there. So you have worked into this sort of collaborative arrangement where everyone's willing to challenge themselves a little bit more and a little bit more. You're working, um, you know, and you don't have to do it constantly. I think that's one thing that we're finding and perhaps it's associated with the dynamics of dopamine release. But some people have found that is it's in an infancy yet, but we have done it over a 10 minute span in that onward and upward study where it seems like it doesn't drop down to baseline when you're ready for the next factor to be played. It stays up if it's within a certain period of time. And if indeed that's what's happening with the dopamine, there's some time you have to work with maybe between 10 and 20 minutes even where you can maintain a little more upward level of, of the rewarding system in play. And so, you know, you don't have to pepper it. You just have to uh, be ready to add the next thing when it kind of comes up and script the first thing so that you feel comfortable yourself as a coach. Um, so I'm gonna first ask them which corner of the goal do they wanna go for, for example. Um, and I think, yeah, that uh, I find most people actually like to start with autonomy support for whatever reasons, and then external focus, and then work on building confidence, which is maybe the hardest one because it involves a series. Mm. Uh, it's it's really interesting it. you bring up that that time frame because another one of our questions leads quite nicely to that, and um, and it's do you find differences in um, immediates and experts first, but also. Is there any research supporting a long-term effect for this so far? Um, and what your guys' thoughts would be on that? There are, I mean, most motor learning studies use, you know, interval, retention intervals that are relatively short. Most of them, I'd say, use a day uh, between practice and the retention and transfer test. But there are other ones that have looked at, um, you know, longer retention. Two days a week. Um, I'm aware yeah. of a study um, that looked at uh, the reward of social, uh, monetary reward as the, the form of it. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the results lasted for at least a month, which was the last time they measured that mm -hmm. and between group differences at that time. So the sense is you get them started on a trajectory and they can uh, promulgate outward. Yeah, it's great. And uh, I think we've got, uh, Ed may potentially have a question as, as Ed always typically does. So do you want to come in on that, Ed? Are you, you happy to jump in? I'll unmute I can you. come in now. I, I can come back in now, right, if, if possible. I, I have a question because of what Phil had asked about the windsurfing. Um, I probably like a lot of people on here have your your book, Attention to Motor Skill Learning, Gabby. And there's a windsurfer on the front cover of that. And now, now I realize why a windsurfer, but I'm assume, I'm wondering, is that you on the cover or is that not you on the cover? Actually, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a good photo. But I do, I bring... Uh, <laughs> uh, I bring it up for... Uh, I bring it up for a, as, for a purpose, though. Um, I, I do bring out that book up for a purpose because I think that book is something that people should should look to look to that your that book attention and motor skill learning for especially either for academics around here but also for people who are able to trace back the the research but it also brings me to another book which I think is very important because I've, I've you know even listening to you Rebecca the the language that we use with people is so important when we want to engage with them and 
and a friend of ours on Mo Moving Skill Acquisition who's already asked a question, Nick Winkleman. And now you guys are a friend because you, you're now guests of ours. Uh, his book, his recent book, The Language of Coaching is also available. And I think as a little couplet around the evidence and around the application of the evidence between your, your book, Attention to Motor Skill Learning, and Nick's book, the, the Language of Coaching, I think for people listening in who have a huge, who, who may be newer to this and the application of external focus of attention and the optimal learning and the optimal theory, I think those two together can, can provide people with a real um, strong resource from both an academic perspective, but also the applied perspective for coaches who, who are looking for some, like, like a lot of coaches, and, and it's great, who are looking for some easy, quick wins initially when they're trying to try, to try something new. Um, so I think it's just important to let people know that there are resources uh, out there and some like your, your, set, your, your own one, which is back in 2007 and a more recent one by, by Nick. So that's all. Yeah. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, that's a good point. And you're absolutely right. You know, everything we've presented today is related to how you word instructions or feedback. So it doesn't cost anything. You know, it just requires perhaps a change in how you talk with people and what kind of instructions you give. So it's really easy to do if you know, you know, what you need to do. to end yeah, Which marks you need to hit. And I think that's that's been one of the, the key pieces yeah. is distilling a lot of literature and finding they fall into these three um, buckets and Absolutely. how far you can get by just knowing something in those buckets. I'm sure there will be more that we will, you know, uncover in the future, but it's straightforward and, you know, based on a lot of work. I, I think, I think one of the things, and it's a sport that's come up already a little bit is where optimal theory has had a big impact is in the sport of golf. Um, the, the golf coaches, uh, I, 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 I'm, I love working with golf coaches because they, they come very often with such a huge technical understanding and knowledge of the game. But when they are able to couple that with what the evidence suggests around what optimal theory suggests and the other, the other aspects of external focus of attention, it's, there's this lovely combination then of, I have the technical knowledge, but I also know how to get that out of the person by maybe not focusing on the technical so much. Yeah, lovely. It's yeah. a lovely balance to be able to know. I, 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 of course, I need to know the technical aspects, but I also need to know how to make sure I don't have them focus on the technical aspects. And right. I'm very yeah. fortunate in recent to to see some world class golf coaches in, embracing the research, like uh, and the and the application of optimal theory. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. I think yeah. Um, we've got. I think we've got time for one more question. So Phil. I think I might jump in here instead, Ali, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah. We've got a, a question from um, YouTube, and we're trying to get through them as, as much as you can. So uh, there's a question on, does attention or motivation contribute more to learning? So if an external cue is provided in an autonomy-controlling way, which mechanism is more influential? <laughs> I think that's an empirical question. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what the focus cue is and how you, you know, how controlling you are. Um, so, um, we, yeah, I mean, we have not found one to be more yeah. important than another. And but, we have found that, uh, you know, practitioners have their own favorites. And so because their confidence matters too, um, you know, that may be as good as anything to start with what they feel they could most benefit from or choose to do. Um, but we really haven't seen an order effect or an effect of starting with X and then going. Um, and in fact, some of our other studies sort of sort of show in any given operationalization that the impact of one is about equal to the impact of the others. So we can't say that, that we know that, even yeah. though there might be some, you know, priorities out there. <laughs> Yeah, but I would definitely avoid controlling language, which was the, the question, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you can ruin one, one with the me. other. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's great, um, Gabby and Rebecca. Thank you so much for your time. We actually we have we have quite a few more questions still to ask, but I'm just conscious of 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 time. Um, so thank you very much. You know, um, our 
our webinar series is entitled Women Who Change the Discussion. And uh, I think given the large body of research and, and, and stuff that you've produced, um, definitely would put you in that category. So, so thank you very much for your, uh, for your time today. And uh, again, hopefully if you've been on Zoom or you've been watching on YouTube, you've uh, again, found that useful. Um, so that's, that's, that's episode one done. Um, so again, uh, next week we have um, Professor Nicola Hodges and that's on Friday the 16th of October at 6 p.m. Irish time. So keep an eye on Twitter for uh, further announcements on that and how to register and, and also the YouTube live link. Um, and again, also, uh, if you want to check out some of our um, episodes from the previous webinar series we did earlier this year, also check that out on the YouTube link. And again, a big thank you again to uh, the 20 by 20 campaign for their support. Um, so they've just launched, launched their fifth and final chapter of their campaign, which is the future for women in sport, choose what's next. And um, they're, they're have the question, which is um, based around the think it, ask it. So it's a nationwide call to arms to help provoke permanent change for women in sport, to inspire them in media, education, business and sport. And I think, you know, for, for anybody, be it male or female, watching Gabby and Rebecca's presentation tonight, certainly um, inspire people to check out that research and maybe utilize some of the things that they've talked about in, in their practice. So, so that's for me. Thanks from all of us um, for tuning in and I uh, hope you have a great rest of the week and uh, hopefully see you again all soon. Bye.